A recent chat between Lex Friedman of internet fame and Jim Keller, CTO of TensTorrent and former employee of Tesla and other major companies has revealed just how advanced Tesla is in many areas of AI and machine learning. The conversation, however, is very dense and packed with tech terminology. Let's see if we can explore a bit more fully what these two brilliant gentlemen discussed. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. A viewer, Raga Zaga, which is an awesome Twitter handle by the way, passed on several Lex clips where Lex Friedman is talking with Jim Keller, who has worked on processors with Tesla, AMD, Apple, and Intel, and is now working for TensTorrent. These brief clips are so packed with information, I thought it would be really nice to break them down a bit for my viewing audience. Today, let's take on two of the clips concerning Tesla's autopilot software. The links to them are in the description if you want to take a closer look. Anyway, I hope I can help explain things a little bit. First, however, let's take a little sidetrack and ask what TensTorrent is and why Keller has become associated with it. As Fortune said back in January, quote, the almost five-year-old company's goal is creating chips for training machine learning programs that leapfrog current technologies. TensTorrent's strategy is using software to better allocate the use of computing power on each chip, end quote. So the basic idea, as far as I understand it, is that hardware and software will sort of become merged in a sense, and software will help the hardware actually work better in terms of machine learning technology. And TensTorrent's new technology seems to be bearing that out. Their new Grayskull ha, 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 processor is capable of 368 tops per chip, which is far, far higher than, say, Tesla's 72 tera operations per second per chip in their hardware 3. Anyway, this is super cool technology to keep track of, and we should definitely pay attention to TensTorrent, and maybe I should actually do an episode on it. But for now, this is just a roundabout way of saying that Keller is a big deal and he really knows his stuff. So let's start with something that seemed to confuse Lex Friedman, but I actually kind of know, I think, more than he does at the moment. Wow, that's a scary thought. Anyway, he questioned what was different in Tesla's software 2.0. And that's actually the principles of the software 2.0, like you mentioned with Andre, is... Uh... It's not just, I mean, I don't know what the actual, his description of software 2.0 is. If it's just high level philosophical or there's specifics. So while Lex was questioning what exactly it was, I think from looking at Andre Karpathy's lectures and his public pronouncements, what they're basically doing is they're completely rewriting what was originally mostly C++ hard coding in version 1.0, and they're replacing that with 4D neural networking. I've done several episodes on the topic, and I'll link some of the videos up here if you're interested. But the super nutshell version is that the new software is not really hard-coded decision-making processes as much as it is deep neural networks that are being trained to make decisions on their own. So basically, it's a whole different architecture. Rather than asking, what do you do at a stop sign? What do you do here? What do you do here? What do you do here? They actually feed the data to the neural networks and the neural networks figure it out and they are in charge of everything. Now, up until now, software 2.0 has been kind of contained inside software 1.0. So it's had like kind of a I guess a sandbox to play in, but it sounds like they're really kind of removing all of the buffers around it and they're going pretty much solely with deep neural network technology now. And of course the 4D aspect of it is that we're looking at this all over time, not individual frames one at a time that each one is being taken in and ingested and looked at and then tossed, but taking it as a video sequence and looking at the whole thing so that you have a persistence of memory, etc. right? So if you see a person and they pass behind something else, you can still remember that that person should be there and expect them to come out the other side of a, a garbage can or a parked car or something like that. So this makes the car operate much more like a human being does, and it's a huge improvement over the previous versions of the software. So anyway, that part is really cool. The two of them also talk about iterating the network rapidly, and basically what they're talking about is automating as many steps as possible and creating a data engine that basically feeds itself. Well, the one really important thing is also what they're doing well is how to iterate that quickly, which means like it's not just about one time deployment, one building, it's constantly iterating the network mm -hmm. and trying to automate as many steps as possible, right? Yeah. What I think Andre calls the data engine, it's like, it's the mm -hmm. iterative improvement of the mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. You have a neural network that uh, does stuff, fails on a bunch of things and learns from it over and over and over. So you're constantly discovering edge cases. Mm -hmm. So it's very much about uh, like data engineering, like figuring out, 
it's, it's, it's kind of what you were talking about with tense torrent is you have the data landscape. You have to walk along that data landscape in a way that uh, that's constantly improving the 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 neural network. I love that the two of them talk about best walking the data landscape. So you can sort of imagine the data of all the full self driving and everything else, all the data that's being fed into it is kind of like, a, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why I imagine some post-apocalyptic landscape, but you know, you're on this post-apocalyptic landscape and you've got your heavy duty UV glasses on and you're walking and maybe you can't even see anymore. So you're using a, um, a, a cane and you're tapping out where is around you. And so what you're looking for is a path through all of this stuff and the best path possible, but you can't see very far. So you have to walk quickly and you have to learn how to get around. So anyway, it's a very cool metaphor, but basically what they're talking about is that if these computers can feed themselves, if instead of using labeled data that's labeled by humans or something, they can actually say, I'm missing information about this particular area, they can then automate the process of going and finding more of that information and training themselves on that information. So basically we're taking away the human limitation factor and replacing that with computers, which are much, much faster than human beings. And as I talked about in previous videos, what they're looking for now is a lot of edge cases that don't work. So that would be situations where I, love, I think the classic is a stop sign that's partially obscured, although I'm sure they've solved that problem by now. But maybe it's a stop sign that says, except for right turns or something, right? So it's a stop sign with a modifier, or maybe it's one of those things where it's a stop sign that a person is holding up, but when they drop it, the stop sign is no longer active, right? So these are edge cases. And instead of having human beings have to go look for this, the computer itself can go look for these edge cases and it can find this information. One of the biggest problems with machine learning, at least the traditional version of it, the bugaboo that's always in the room, is data labeling. The human factor is so, so important to this. If you have to have a human being label every single piece of video data or every single picture, it's going to take forever and it's actually going to become kind of impossible to scale it. So we need to remove human beings out of the equation as much as possible. Again, as Andre Carpathia has talked about, it's Operation Vacation, where the team of software engineers can go on a vacation and the computer is still training and learning while they're doing that. That's their goal. They then mentioned GPT-3 as a guide, and GPT-3, I didn't even realize this, but it's basically all unsupervised learning. So all of the data is kind of always there for the computers to learn with and to train with. You, you find edge cases that don't work, and then you define something that goes get you data for that. Mm -hmm. But then the, the other constraint is whether you have to label it or not. Like the, the, the amazing thing about like the GPT-3 stuff is it's unsupervised. Yeah. So there's essentially infinite amount of data. Now there's obviously infinite amount of data available from cars of people successfully driving. But, you know, the, the, the current pipelines are mostly running on labeled data, which is human limited. And GPT-3, by the way, is definitely worthy of its own video. So if you're interested in that, definitely ask me in the comments. But basically what we get to is that human beings are currently the limiting factor for most artificial intelligence training. Humans are slow. Humans don't like to label data because it's boring as hell. <laughs> and humans also make mistakes at this stuff. So, so we're not perfect at it either, right? If you're just kind of bored and you're just waking up and you're just pushing a button, there's a good chance that you're gonna miss some of this important data. So human beings are really, really bad. You don't want humans to be the limiting factor in your AI technology. So you want your machine learning algorithms and your machine learning computers to be able to go out and suck in data that it's interested in by itself and either label it or not even need the labeling when it's doing the training. Essentially, unlabeled self-training data is scalable or effectively infinite, as Jim says. Whereas anything that has to be labeled by human beings is by definition finite because we can only do so much work in our lifetimes. So, so then he turns to talking about the size of the network that results from an infinite type of data model. So when that becomes un, unsupervised, right, it, it, it'll create unlimited amount of data, which then they'll scale. Now the networks that may use that data might be way too big for cars, but then there'll be the transformation from now we have unlimited data, I know exactly mm -hmm. what I want. Now can I turn that into something that fits in the car? And that, pro that process is gonna happen all over the place. Every time you get to the place where you have unlimited data, and that's what software 2.0 is about, unlimited data training networks to do stuff without humans writing code to do it. 
And what he means by this is that the neural network model size can become really, really large with an infinite data set to represent all of that data. And obviously a supercomputer cluster like Dojo can work on something this size, or at least can get close to that, but it's not going to fit on the much, much smaller memory and processing and power limitations of the inference engine that's in your Tesla right now. In theory, neural networks can model any function, including driving, given enough data and enough neural network size. But the problem is the neural network model size can become too big to fit into a practical computer. For Keller, software 2.0 is all about unlimited data. If you don't need to get labeled data, you can go get what you need from the massive amount of data that's out there from what your fleet is taking in. But then he goes on to talk about how this issue is more of a general issue. Every time you move from human limited to effectively unlimited data, you're going to need to move to a different mode of working. So instead of human limited, now what you've got is processor or power constrained or memory constrained. And that brings us to the interesting question of whether Tesla's Hardware 3 is adequate to run these networks. And again, you can see some videos on Tesla Hardware 3 up here. You know, my, my wonder was, is, you know, Hardware 3, is it enough computing off by 2, off by 5, off uh -huh. by 10, off by 100? Yeah. And, and I, I thought it probably wasn't enough, but they're doing pretty well with it now. So as you just heard, Keller at first thought that there was going to be some multiple that Hardware 3 was going to be off. Like it was going to be two times too slow or 10 times too slow or something. But now he's starting to think that we might be able to actually manage full self-driving on the current hardware we have. And this, by the way, is huge. If this wasn't the case, either Tesla would have to replace all of the hardware to get full self-driving to work with a Hardware 4, or the 1.5 million or so Hardware 3 versions of Teslas would not be good enough to run full self-driving. It's obviously much, much better for Tesla and for Tesla owners if Hardware 3 is adequate to run full self-driving. And finally, Kessler gets into talking about refactoring the network. The data set gets bigger, the training gets better, and then there's this interesting thing is, you sort of train and build an arbitrary size network that solves the problem. And then you refactor the network down to the thing that you can afford to, to ship, mm -hmm. right? So the, the goal isn't to build a network that fits in the phone, it's to build something that actually works. And then, then how do you make that most effective on the hardware you have? And they seem to be doing that much better than a couple of years ago. So what he's talking about is taking a huge neural network model that might fit into something like Dojo with almost infinite computing processing power and memory and fitting that into the little space that you have in the Tesla inference engine. So first of all, what is refactoring? Well, it's basically like the factors of a number, right? You break down the problem into its constituent simplest parts. Like if you take 12, for example, one and two and three and four and six are all factors of 12. In code, the idea is to simplify the elements, thus making it easier for simpler computers to run it while still maintaining the original behavior. So what does this all mean? Well, unlimited power, itty bitty living space. Phenomenal cosmic power. Dojo and or supercomputing clusters are the unlimited power. The car is the itty bitty living space. So basically Keller is saying they have to take the massive version of the network that they can run on Dojo and they have to refactor it into something that's close to as good, but can operate within the power, memory and processing constraints of the mobile chips in a Tesla. All right, so whew, that was a lot of technology packed into one thing. Even explaining it seemed like an awful lot really fast, but at least I hopefully expanded it a little bit and made it more accessible to a lot of other people. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, subscribe for more of this. I will have other Lex Friedman clips in the future to talk about, so I think it'd be really cool if you could uh, join me on that trip. Also, a huge thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon. You all are wonderful. I really do appreciate the support. And a shout out to Zenly Music for doing the intro and conclusion music. Thank you. And don't forget about our merch store, which has the All Input is Error t-shirt and a bunch of other t-shirts and hoodies and mugs and tumblers, etc., etc. And finally, don't forget that we are Tesla affiliates. If you click the link in the description and you order a Tesla, we each get a thousand free supercharger miles. Or if you click our Amazon link in the description and you go on Amazon and go shopping, you actually help support the channel. It's a very simple thing to do and I really appreciate it. And in the meantime, please do feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.